I think um, we'll start. Um, we're on time, we're being German, so we better follow what is expected of you, if you're ready. Um, yes. Let me welcome everybody who's here tonight. Um, and I see a growing number of people dialing in. So I guess while I'm presenting our um, guest speaker, Martin Biloff, tonight, we'll have some more coming in. Um, Martin Biloff uh, is a um, assistant professor at uh, in Bulgaria. Oh, no, no, it's, it's a full professor, full professor. It's a full professor now. Oh, yeah. OK, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no sure. Um, a full professor now at the University of Sofia, and I'm not going even to try to pronounce the name. If you would like to to help me out with that, what is it? It's, the University of uh, the name is Saint Clement Ochritsky, or Sveti Clement Ochritsky, depending on whether okay. you want it <laughs> English or the Bulgarian. <laughs> um, and. Um, He's uh, been very intensely involved in a number of uh, European settings. He's been a guest speaker and also a guest professor at a number of European universities. As always, I'm not going to present him with his entire curriculum vitae. All of us are able to use the internet and um, I'm a strong believer that sometimes reading things keeps us uh, in a better memory than, than others do. He's um, specializing in constitutional and comp comparative constitutional law, and that's why we ask him to join us tonight, because as this uh, Ringvorlesung, this lecture series, is concentrating on the effects of algorithms on democratic values, democratic systems, on the democratic ideal as such, we're trying to explore also what are the changing parameters. And last week we were looking at it from a criminal legal point, and tonight is the night to look at it from a comparative constitutional and also legal philosophy point. And that's why we ask Martin Bilov, who's uh, very much in a comparative legal setting, very involved in this, uh, in order to provide us with the insights from his theoretical background and open a discussion with us. As you all know, um, we usually give our lecturer the chance to speak uh, for about 45, 40 minutes, something like this. Tonight, we will not have a student, unfortunately, to comment on uh, his uh, lecturing. That's usually one of the things where we like to include our students and introduce them to the scientific discourse. That didn't work out tonight, unfortunately. So we will, right after that, jump into the open discussion. If you have questions, Christoph Borchardt is going to moderate tonight. Either um, do a sign uh, by hand or send us something through the chat and let us know that you would like to ask, and then we will assemble that. And having said that, Martin, I'm really excited. I'm grateful that you're here and that you jumped on it. We met uh, at a conference virtually in Rome, uh, and it was very impressive what Martin presented there. So I'm delighted to hear you now on your core topics, and you have the floor. Oh, thank you very much, Indra, and I would like to thank uh, Indra and Crystal for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. Uh, I hope it will be worth the invitation, and I will not disappoint you. I will try to be as fast and furious as possible. As usual, I, I'll speak very fast, so if it's too fast, just raise your hand. It's like in the, the dentist uh, in our chair and say, oh, no, that's too much. But I want to, you know, uh, fill in these 40 minutes with stuff, so... Um, Again, many thanks also to the normative uh, orders, to the University of Frankfurt and the, all the, the, the organizers and co-organizers. These uh, really interesting and fascinating, uh, as much as I can see from the poster and the description uh, lecture series. Having said that, I'm going to just immediately share my screen. I hope you see the presentation, right? Yes, perfectly. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we are skipping the first five minutes of technical uh, problems that usually the people have. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are getting used to Zoom teaching, and one day it will be very difficult to bring us back to real teaching, <laughs> the real conference, into real life. But that's the way it is. Maybe we'll meet each other in the metaverse, but that's another story. Okay, so this is uh, you know um, uh, I was teaching also German constitutional law and European law at Ceres Germanicum, and my professor, my my director there called me the Gutalvis Tenizite Junge, so I I have to be uh, squared and structured. And that's why I'm giving you also, I'm starting with an outline of the presentation just to give you a glimpse of what I'm going to talk about this evening. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, outline the normative concepts that are, uh, you know, uh, necessary for, uh, you know, uh, grasping the new normative orders and to cope with the title, the general title of the cluster. And then I'm going to uh, 
relatively briefly present you uh, three types of constitutionalism uh, that I'm trying to develop as a theory of mine, maybe. Uh, namely, these are the Westphalian, the post-Westphalian, and the neo-Westphalian constitutionalism, because I strongly believe, un and unfortunately, it seems that uh, the world is going in that direction, that we are in a big swirl, in a, uh, a, a constitutionalism in flux. And uh, these are actually the three models that we have experienced uh, for a long time of our history, for short period of our uh, recent history, and maybe we're going to experience in the near future. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to talk a lot about crisis. So uh, don't, don't, don't say that I'm pessimistic. <laughs> I usually <laughs> I'm used to say bad news with a smile. So maybe that's why Indra invited me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to talk about crisis tr uh, twice. First, I'm going to explain why uh, the world is transiting towards something different from traditional nation, nation state constitutionalism. My uh, earlier suggestions, like in the 2018, were that we're going towards post-Westphalian uh, global constitutionalism, as most of the scholars actually maybe started to guess uh, that this is the direction. But then uh, it seems that uh, the world is taking the swirl and going towards new Westphalianism, which is not, I, I would say, the best direction, but that's the way I see it at the moment. And then I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, my mo more recent pessimism, namely uh, I'm going to talk about constitutional polycrisis on the edge between th these three types of constitutionalism and why this constitutional polycrisis, which is both external and inter uh, internal for the constitutional orders, is producing a shift towards something which doesn't look to be very uh, positive tendency, namely uh, that we're witnessing a uh, objective push towards a global al algorithmic technocracy. And of course, I'm going to outline uh, what's that, and I'm going to jump to some conclusions. So that's the menu for uh, this evening. These are some of the concepts that I'm going to uh, discuss. I just have outlined them. Uh, I'm not sure if that facilitates the understanding of my presentation or <laughs> makes it uh, more complex, but these are actually, uh, so to say, the keywords I'm going to use and the key concepts that I'm going to uh, present briefly in the course of the presentation. So this beautiful picture, uh, which is taken from the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, is actually demonstrating how the Westphalian constitutionalism looked like for a quite long time. You know, it was a puzzle, a mosaic, a carpet, a patchwork of uh, national territorial structures stuck within close territoriality. Having said that, I have to outline the main aspects of uh, Westphalian constitutionalism which are its main features. And I'm um, just uh, uh, making that in the form of uh, keywords. So if you have, uh, if you want me to uh, expand on this, just ask me in the discussion. Um, but uh, this is something which seems relatively obvious. Uh, just to maybe uh, make the long story short, I have to uh, tell you that under Westphalian constitutionalism, I uh, understand uh, the traditional nation state territorial constitutionalism. Under post-Westphalian constitutionalism, uh, I understand uh, something close to global constitutionalism. And then under uh, post-Westphalian constitutionalism, uh, I'm sorry, new Westphalian constitutionalism, I understand uh, uh, um, supranational regionalism. So uh, kind of relatively novel tendency uh, for structuring, for mastering, for channeling globalization in the forms of regions. Uh, of course, I, I don't get much time to explain why I'm not using these terms uh, instead of uh, 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 Westphalian, post-Westphalian, New Westphalian, but actually uh, this will maybe seem uh, more clear uh, in the course of my presentation. Just to give you a glimpse, uh, my focus here is on hierarchy and not so much on the other aspects of uh, national and global constitutions. So these are uh, some of the main features of uh, Westphalian constitutionalism, uh, namely it's a sovereignistic uh, uh, system based on uh, these traditional uh, absolute holistic non-transferable and indivisible sovereignty defined by uh, normative authors like Rousseau and the others. Uh, it is based on the predominance of the political uh, over expert institutions. Uh, a very good uh, example would be, you know, this very famous quotation from the decision of the Bundesverfassungsgericht that, uh, you know, uh, 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 there is a ununterbrochene demokratische legitimationskette, which stems from the people and goes uh, through the parliament and the political bodies to the other uh, more technical uh, institutions. Uh, it is based on closed statehood, on exclusive ter territoriality of public power defined by some authors such as Mark Antonzi or uh, uh, Neil Brenner as, as a territorial container. Um, it is very much hierarchical in all possible aspects. Uh, hierarchy is the main uh, matrix of constitutional geometry 
used uh, for ordering both the normative, the institutional, and the territorial order of Westphalian constitutionalism. And of course, it presupposes absolute constitutional supremacy over international law. Uh, and uh, that's a bit of a mistake here. I don't think there was supranational law in the times when Westphalian constitutionalism existed. So it's much more uh, constitutional supremacy over international treaties. <coughs> With the optional uh, possible feature that some of these uh, uh, Westphalian constitutional orders have been multi-level constitutional constructions, mostly structured as federations, some of them as confederations. So, uh, other features. Uh, Westphalian constitutionalism is exclusively vertical, state-centered constitutionalism. Uh, so, two uh, aspects of constitutionalism that emerged relatively recently uh, in the course of the last decades of the 20th century uh, and the beginning of the 21st century, namely the constitutionalism beyond statehood, uh, more precisely supranational constitutionalism, and what uh, Teubner, uh, Eugene Priven, and other, uh, others call societal constitutionalism, they were actually inexistent or meager or suppressed in the context of uh, uh, Westphalian constitutional modernity. This means also that human rights and private actors' opportunities were uh, possible only within, through, and against the state and the domestic institutions of public power, uh, public power limited to state power and based on a very clear public-private divide, which of course was, was one of the main achievements of early uh, Western modernity. So territorial statehood and this public-private divide uh, were actually uh, characteristic features of uh, the modernity, of the legal modernity and constitutional modernity, which of course does not permit, permit any governance. Uh, this was the general outline of the general uh, scheme of Westphalian constitutionalism, and I have to say a few words about democracy as part of this uh, overall scheme. Uh, namely, it was territorially uh, based and territorially uh, entrenched, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, regime. Uh, I always like to quote here Sheila Ben Habib. Uh, she says, democracy requires closure, and if you look at uh, the way our constitutional orders are still, uh, uh, you know, uh, fine-tuned towards territoriality. Uh, it exposes also their vulnerability towards trans-territorial, post-territorial, and non-territorial phenomena, which go beyond this territorial container. Moreover, uh, it was national sovereignty, democracy, uh, representative part democracy, and uh, uh, another uh, um, uh, nice quotation, namely that democracy is actually polyarchic, comes from Robert Dahl. Uh, so, uh, de facto, the, our representative democratic systems were polyarchical based on uh, two main devices for the people to control the elites, namely uh, the right of arbitration, you know, to punish and to, uh, benef uh, to uh, um, give benefits to the political elites, and also the accountability. Uh, furthermore, uh, there was a fragile equilibrium between constitutional conflict and constitutional consensus, quite uh, widely, for example, researched in a German context, which was a necessary uh, precondition for uh, Westphalian democracy. And it was also based on other uh, uh, very important marriages. So sometimes when I, when I speak about that, I feel like a, a constitutional family lawyer uh, because I'm talking a lot about marriage and divorce here. And there were three very important marriages, uh, which unfortunately are falling apart right now. And that uh, um, uh, you know, uh, promotes very angry children <laughs> coming out of these families, the first marriage was the marriage between liberalism, uh, between liberalism and democracy. This uh, divorce is quite uh, extensively researched in the last five, six years. Uh, so uh, it relates to the emergence of a liberal democracy, of populist constitutionalism, but also more recently uh, uh, there were books written about the other uh, you know, side of the spectrum, namely the authoritarian liberalism, a very good book written by Mike Wilkinson from uh, London School of Economics. Um, uh, the other divorce is the divorce between representation and democracy, uh, which is also fundamental, unfortunately. Uh, and the third divorce, which I think is the worst one, is the divorce between capitalism and democracy, right? Because uh, capitalism was the necessary precondition for democracy, but only in the form of democratic capitalism pacified through welfare state and some democratic buffers. Um, so, um, how does Westphalian constitutionalism relate to algorithmic constitutionalism? Uh, because I have to tell you that I'm much more specialist in uh, Westphalian than in algorithmic constitutionalism. Uh, so I'm a bit outsider uh, uh, on the topic, although I have published uh, recently an edited volume on the IT revolution and its impact on state constitutionalism and public law, but it's a you know, uh, patchwork of different words. So 
I work there on transhumanism. Uh, so uh, algorithmic constitutionalism was, of course, incremental, uh, underdeveloped, and close to unexistent in the context of Westphalian constitutionalism, of course, for technological reasons, but also because it didn't match quite well the territorial structure of power. Information technologies were uh, used mostly as facilitators, as instruments, as tools for uh, traditional forms of deliberation and communication. <laughs> and uh, the late Westphalian constitutionalism in the, uh, at the end of the 20th century gradually cha was challenged by the emergence of internet, which was uh, uh, also conceptually um, different from uh, territoriality of power as first global algorithmic post-territorial and trans-territorial public space. Now, uh, that's the maze uh, of transition, and we're going towards another citation from Sheila Ben-Habib. Uh, she says, we are like travelers navigating an unknown terrain with the help of old maps drawn at different time and in response to different needs. And while the terrain we're traveling on the world uh, society of states has changed, our normative map has not. And I, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, feel very much uh, represented by this uh, quotation. That's why I believe we have to peel the orange, right, to deconstruct some traditional concepts that uh, we use to explain the Westphalian world in order to see whether they're still capable of explaining and mastering the emergent post-Westphalian or neo-Westphalian reality and to avoid deconstitutionalization of the world society. Uh, so that's where we are at the moment, right? Uh, virtually. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yesterday I, I read a very famous quotation from Shakespeare and it's quite suitable here. He says, uh, the hell is empty, the devils are out, are here, right? So uh, these are some of the factors which produce the crisis of the Stalin constitutionalism, globalization in conjunction with technological revolution with uh, all of its aspects. Of course, frequently we put the emphasis on information uh, revolution, but it is uh, very much uh, related also to a range of other technological uh, developments, which create, of course, as all industrial and technological revolutions, huge asymmetries. The huge difference nowadays is that these asymmetries are much uh, feasible, much larger, much, much more visible than before. And second, that they are really global, right? So previously it took uh, uh, centuries or decades uh, for them to spread. Now they're, it's, it's taking like, like, uh, like years. Uh, and uh, I was uh, really, uh, I found it really funny in October when I saw the first uh, volume of the Journal of Digital History, right? So <laughs> digital constitutionalism and algorithmic constitutionalism was something very innovative, close to science fiction like seven years ago. <laughs> and now it has already history, which shows how uh, following Manuel Castell's uh, thoughts, uh, you know, the, uh, the time is speeding up and it's not linear, uh, especially in the constitutional one, social sciences and humanities. Right? These are some other determinants of the crisis, uh, uh, which in conjunction produce uh, uh, shifts towards something else. And um, uh, these are uh, some other, uh, so we're talking about the determinants now. These are some of the main aspects of, this, uh, of the crisis. I'm going to talk about that a bit later as well. Um, but um, if you're interested, we can talk also about the inability of the static territorially entrenched rule of law to cope with spaces of laws to follow uh, again Manuel Castell's terminology. Uh, spaces of laws, which are, for example, the migration flaws, the pandemic flaws, uh, the, fi the financial capital flaws, and the information flaws, which are of concern here, right? And which are trans territorial and a territorial and post territorial in a sense. Um, now, a few words about post Westphalian constitutionalism. I'm sorry I didn't find a better picture. <laughs> That's a little bit like from the sci-fi movies of, from the 80s, you know, <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is. Um, so uh, that's what seems to have happened in the last 30 years, right? We witnessed uh, fragmentation of sovereignty and the emergence of sector-specific sovereignties. Um, uh, we witnessed the rise and the, um, uh, you know, uh, the positive and negative history that the concept of constitutional identity is made throughout the, the comparative constitutional realm, you know, because it was born for one thing and it served for another. Uh, then uh, open statehood started to spread both legally in terms of rules of recognition of international and supranational law and in terms of substantial social legal opening of statehood. And we have even, I believe, witnessed something which we can define as fluid statehood, 
you know, power uh, tracing the people and the flows and not uh, stuck in the territory, but uh, which is also in conceptual contradiction to the territorial container of the previous centuries. Uh, what has also uh, happened is the emergence of post-territoriality, trans-territoriality, and territoriality, alternative forms of territoriality, uh, global fluidity of the demos, and space of flows. Um, now, actually, it's very paradoxical because in the years of confinement, we are witnessing both crisis of territoriality and crisis of crisis of territoriality. So it's very uh, pervert, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's both uh, spreading that crisis, so a lot of uh, of our constitutional institutions doesn't work well with traditional uh, concepts uh, attached to territoriality. On the other hand, we have witnessed the re-emergence of territoriality uh, in the form of pandemic uh, restraints. Uh, these are some other uh, features uh, which serve the promotion of uh, post-Westphalian constitutionalism. And here what might be, uh, what needs a special emphasis is uh, the uh, rise of expertocracy on all levels, as you will see, uh, uh, we have witnessed the massive uh, rise of global judicial empire. We have uh, witnessed, uh, which was facilitated, especially in the context of the European Union, uh, due to the judicial dialogue between the uh, so-called apex courts, uh, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Constitu domestic constitutional courts. We have even witnessed the small uh, battles here and there, atomic wars. Uh, for example, there, was, uh, there were, were some bombs dropped in uh, Karlsruhe and especially in Warsaw uh, just a couple of months ago uh, when I spoke with some German colleagues which were involved in that decision they, they said uh, well I, I, I told them but this will be kind of a war atomic war they said no it will be just a very small bomb dropped in the middle of Europe it will not be a fully fleshed you know uh, uh, war it will be just a uranium small bomb uh, and uh, of course uh, these are another important features which globalization brought to constitutional law, uh, the uh, uh, broadening of public power to supranational, international, and transnational sources, um, uh, which also promoted subnational, uh, uh, you know, um, centers of power. Uh, clear examples are uh, the rise of independent uh, and autonomy movements in Spain, in Italy, and in the UK, uh, the blurring of the public-private divide, uh, uh, the Gaining a foment of societal, uh, societal constitutionalism. Um, and uh, thus, uh, when we have to discuss the relationship between post Westphalian constitutionalism and algorithmic constitutionalism, algorithmic constitutionalism seems at the first glance as a natural ally of global and post Westphalian constitutionalism. This is due to the fact that internet and the new social media are themselves trans territorial, post territorial, and a territorial phenomena. They are promoting globalization via deterritorialization, uh, creating uh, regional and global networks, circles, and space of information flows. But it has also to be taken into account that the early post Westphalian constitutionalism doesn't possess sufficient clear explanatory and ordering matrices for algorithmic constitutionalism, as we have witnessed in the last decades. Uh, this also leads to the emancipation of internet based public uh, power phenomena uh, from the conceptual ordering and power grid of constitutionalism, both within and beyond statehood. And now uh, let's come to the more tragical events that we're recently witnessing uh, and uh, trends actually, um, namely the rise of uh, supranational regionalism. Um, um, you know, uh, I, I read today, I don't know whether it's a, a fake news or not, but there was a British university which today have advised uh, its students not to read Orwell because it may, uh, <laughs> you know, it may inflict some, uh, you know, uh, troubles in their heads. So actually, uh, a new Westphalian constitutionalism is very much, you know, uh, uh, in line with 1984. Uh, and um, uh, there are actually uh, different, it's a mixture of, uh, of elements uh, which existed before and also which are to an extent novel. So uh, uh, this new Westphalian regionalism, uh, preserves to an extent nation states, it uses its structure uh, and infrastructure. Uh, it tries to get political mobilization through Westphalian sources of power. Um, <clears throat> for example, uh, it tries to use, or more precisely to misuse, devices of uh, representative, deliberative, participatory and direct democracy. Um, its lines of accountability are increasingly dysfunctional, but they're still grounded in the structures of Westphalian constitutional democracy. Uh, it tries to reintroduce both territoriality and hierarchy with, um, uh, for the moment, limited success. 
On the other hand, uh, we are witnessing the preservation of the achievements of uh, uh, post-Westphalian constitutionalism, which uh, kind of uh, um, emerged in the last 20 years or 30 years. Uh, these are things that I have already described. And these are some core features of new Westphalianism, uh, which unfolded in the last years. So we witness a uh, new clash, uh, which has actually smashed the traditional axis of political conflict. So uh, it's much more new nationalism versus new liberalism. And uh, this very pervert, uh, you know, new uh, form of ideology, uh, uh, which is, you know, vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, uh, which is, seems to be the new ideology of the last years replacing old uh, divides between left and right. Uh, uh, also, uh, we are seeing the clash between sovereignism and globalism, uh, strive for reclaiming ultimate jur uh, jurisdictional control by the public power. Uh, the already mentioned divorce uh, uh, described well by many authors like Kasmode or uh, Paul Blocker uh, and, and others, and the reemergence of identity politics, right? So it seems that we're witnessing uh, the forming of big power blocks, some of which are states, other are um, um, supranational or international organizations, which will, uh, however, not limit the existing of cross-cutting jurisdictions, mainly produced by the algorithmic revolution. And uh, so these big power blocks will be kind of uh, brought into a network through and on the basis of uh, algorithmic and uh, digital constitutions. So that's where we are. This is uh, another quotation that I love. Uh, uh, given by Marty Koskeniemi, you know, uh, namely that we are, the world nowadays resembles very much this, namely Kandinsky painting with different uh, forms of constitutional geometry for explaining and ordering the uh, world. Right. Um, unfortunately, neo Westphalian constitutionalism is not necessarily a variant of liberal democracy. It may take the shape of global administrative law, for example, uh, these are suggestions made by, for example, Peter Lindseth uh, regarding the European Union. It may take authoritarian shift. Uh, it may be a patchwork of forms of governance, uh, uh, you know, presented as more democratic or more authoritarian, depending on the social legal context. But also, it may take the trend towards technocracy, namely towards global algorithmic technocracy. Right. So uh, now, a few words about the constitutional policy crisis. Um, again, it has internal and external uh, aspects and dimensions. The internal aspects are more or less clear, I would say, uh, and more or less uh, widely researched. So uh, if we deconstruct the, the, the slogan, representative party democracy, uh, it's obvious that we're, at least for me, uh, but if you disagree, of course, we can uh, discuss that in the, in the question and answer session. Uh, we're witnessing crisis of representation of democracy, of party democracy, of also the strategies for uh, the term used by Klaus Offe, uh, democratization of democracy uh, and crisis of territorial, national and sovereignty democracy, which creates uh, something which is uh, defined also by the European Commission in one of its calls for project a representative democracy in flux, right? So it's kind of a um, statement coming from love as well. Uh, and I, I would say more profound and more, more, more dangerous are the exogenous shocks on the constitutional order. Uh, and it seems that we are actually living for uh, more than a decade in a constitutional poly crisis, where a range of crises are hitting and uh, probing, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the efficiency of our constitutional systems and the legitimacy of our constitutional systems. And unfortunately, these crises are overlapping and they're uh, perpetuating, they're not, not, not vanishing. So these are some of the crises which we have experienced recently and they're, there seem that more crises may, may come in the recent future. Um, so uh, if you read, for example, um, Agamben, uh, it seems that unfortunately, <laughs> the, the 70 years after the World War II in the West and the 30 years after <laughs> the Cold War in the East were a more an exception uh, from a big rule that namely, usually constitutionalism was in crisis. And uh, when I wrote one of, one of my books, about uh, you know the implosion of constitutional democracies, uh, the, the the peer reviewer said, but well, the democracies are usually supposed to be in trouble. You know, this is a typical feature of democracy that it's in permanent crisis, so it's not so bad. I mean, it's kind of systemic um, feature. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid that these are crises which go beyond the traditional and bearable you know 
uh, a scope of democratic uh, uh, disagreement that uh, feeds a, a healthy democracy. Uh, so these are potential aspects of concern. Uh, I, I don't think I'm saying something new here. I'm just systematizing uh, some of the main challenges stemming from uh, uh, digital space uh, towards constitutionalism. So we can see uh, challenges coming from cryptocurrencies, cyber currencies, uh, cyber security, uh, very interesting challenges which will uh, unfold in the next 10 years uh, coming from transhumanism and posthumanism. Uh, much more interesting than these because they're conceptual. They're questioning the very concept of subjectivity and uh, one of the two fundamental ideologies of modern constitutionalism, namely humanism, right? Uh, and of course, you can see a lot of works done uh, uh, re criticizing humanism, uh, mainly from animalist perspective, right? From the uh, perspective of the right of nature, right of an animals. But now uh, we have, of course, we have traditional critics uh, from both liberal dimension that humanism does not fulfill its promises or from extra Western perspective saying that humanism is just an ideology of the West, right? But now uh, this is a game changer, uh, I believe, uh, and will be because we have new technologies. So we are not just speculating about how to order some traditional phenomena. We are <laughs> witnessing a really new world, brave new world, to quote Aldous Huxley that is going to emerge. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quoting Huxley because yesterday Elon Musk, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he was joking, but I, I'm afraid he's not, uh, said that it will be great to have, you know, uh, artificial uh, uh, wombs to relieve the woman from the burden of, uh, of birth, right? So um, these are interesting uh, perspectives to come. Um, so these are other uh, uh, challenges. Some of them are widely researched in literature, like market, market, uh, micro-targeting, filter bubbles. Um, uh, others are not, <laughs> such as the, uh, the risks stemming from the fragmentation of internet, right? Because we have uh, so far believed that internet can always be one and indivisible, although it's not also in the moment, right? We know some uh, Asian countries which uh, kind of create their own regions in internet themselves. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, Internet of Things, Metaverse, Artificial Intelligence, things which are speculative, but I believe that in 2025 we'll have a, a journal of history of Metaverse, <laughs> like this journal of digital history, so uh, things go fast. Right. Uh, and what is also interesting that we have uh, seen, I believe, in the last years, that sometimes emergency creates, creates normalcy, and that uh, uh, the question is, at which moment the magma of social transition will get stabilized in uh, the shape and form of the forthcoming world. These are uh, the three groups of the factors that produce a transition or possible um, uh, risks of transition towards global algorithmic technocracy. They are global, technocratic and algorithmic challenges. These are the global challenges in my view. Um, most of them were actually uh, discussed in the previous parts of my presentation, so you can just have a glimpse and a look on the slide. Um, these are the technological and algorithmic challenges. Um, and these are the technocratic challenges uh, to democracy, uh, producing democratic overburdening. They have different aspects. Uh, procedural aspect, namely the democratic detachment of the decision making. Uh, institutional aspect, you know, uh, for example, the uh, perplexed and multi-layered, non-transparent uh, um, chains of, uh, of uh, governance that produce de-democratization, de-parliamentarization, uh, the widely shared term executive federalism. I'm ascribing it to Habermas, but I don't think it's kind of exclusive right of him. Global judicial empire. Uh, also, we have ep epistemic uh, pressures on uh, uh, democracy and traditional and novel factors producing uh, a tradition from democracy to post-democracy and this very famous quotation or, or, or you know, term uh, coming from Roberto Michels, uh, uh, the, Eisen, uh, the, uh, the Eisenach Gazette, the oligarchy, right? So uh, this is almost, uh, I'm almost done. So I have just, uh, I need just a couple of minutes. I don't know how much time do I have? Uh, perfectly yeah. fine. Anything okay. between five and 10 minutes is perfectly okay. Okay, I can do it also in one, <laughs> but then it will be really algorithmic, you know, you have to decode it afterwards. With the fastness of your speech, um, take a step slower and <laughs> take the 10 minutes. <laughs> I have warned you. Okay, so I'm slowing down. Um, yeah, 
few words about post democracy. Uh, this is a term which has been uh, uh, launched by Colin Crouch uh, in a book <laughs> with the same name, uh, and a bit more or less um, concerns the uh, remoteness of power centers, uh, the rise of influence of hidden power centers, which are uncontrollable through official constitutional chains of accountability, trust, responsibility, legitimacy. The um, 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 crisis of uh, core principles of the Stalin constitutionalism uh, outlined in the third bullet. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it's a, it's a symptom of crisis. It's much more a statement that shows how uh, actually democracy functions uh, due to epistemic and procedural overburdening, namely what uh, this is the phenomenon which Pierre Rosanvalon defines as a negative sovereignty. You know, he says the people uh, can hardly say what they want in such increasingly complex world, but they can say what they don't want, right? So they, they, can, they can draw red lines uh, instead of uh, promoting substantial policies. Uh, and they, of course, increasing lack of transparency and accountability, which is visible both on uh, the demos level and on the parliamentary level. So uh, a famous strategy, I believe, used also in Germany is to flood the, the, the parliament with information. So if, uh, it is <laughs> similar to not give any information at all. Uh, because then you, you need, of course, uh, the way to process the information. And here, that's an important point of intersection with uh, 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 algorithmic constitutionalism, right? So that's a question to which I don't have answer, I have to admit, whether algorithms will, uh, you know, promote democracy in that regard, allow, you know, uh, increase the uh, capacity of state institutions to cope with uh, the increase of data, or it will actually further develop uh, the detachment of technocratic from the democratic uh, arm of government, so to say. And this is an outline of the global algorithmic democracy in a post-democratic setting. Uh, the line of justification follows in the first bullet. So global issues require global solutions, digital issues require digital solutions, big data uh, trigger alg algorithmic solutions, and uh, they all together produce that trend towards algorithmic uh, technocratic solutions. Moreover, we are witnessing the fragmentation of the world as such. So not only the fragmentation of internet, the fragmentation of um, traditional concepts, but also uh, the, the, the fragmentation of the world, something which is defined by uh, Richard Sherwin as digital baroque. You know, he compares the way we understand the world as a multiverse world, right? Because we have different dimensions of our personality. We have a physical dimension, we have social dimension, we have political dimension, but now we have also virtual dimension and they uh, start emancipating from each other. Uh, of course, the me metaverse is still not much more a reality than a metaphor, right? But if we imagine a metaverse world, then we'll have to cope with multiple, you know, uh, realities and to maintain different, uh, uh, you know, uh, figures uh, somehow uniting our personality. Um, so that's uh, increasingly complex uh, for both democracy and authoritarianism to cope with, right? Uh, so it produced not only facade democracy, but also facade authoritarianism, because authoritarianism is also incapable of coping with the complexity of the world of digital Baroque. Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, but algorithmic governance uh, gives uh, promises for uh, being a possible solution in that mess. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it is increasingly detached from both democratic grounds and the monolithic territoriality based authoritarian power center. Uh, so it has to be justified through, if we stick to our traditional concepts, it has to be justified through output legitimacy, rational legitimacy, or pure efficiency. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, it borrows also from non-Western practices, such as, uh, uh, for example, social ranking, uh, which also produced something which uh, uh, Shushana Zubov uh, has defined as surveillance capitalism. Although actually, uh, when I, I'm saying non-Western practices, a student of mine has said, well, but that's not exactly true because if you read Foucault, these practices existed also in the West, right? Uh, in uh, crime and punishment, for example, that, that's well described. So, so that's true. Maybe that's kind of a postmodern uh, technological return back to the roots of uh, non-democracy. Uh, thus, we have to discuss uh, whether and how to cope with the emergent trend towards global algorithmic uh, constitutionalism, how it will be or how can or how we should or should it be reconciled with our uh, the axiology and the design of our constitutional orders. Uh, and we still already have some examples of global technocracy, right? 
global all original, uh, the global judicial empire, the agencyfication in the European Union, the global governance, uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, some brief conclusions. I don't know if I have that much uh, time for them, uh, but uh, it's obvious that we have. Uh, so thank you for uh, the go ahead. I'll use the five minutes to finish. Take your time. Um, Take your time. We are we are all listening. Okay, so you're not not as fellow left or left. No, no, uh, no, no. We are. You're you're not in the metaverse already. <laughs> you're <laughs> with me. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'm in the metaverse, but I'm I'm still with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, yeah, the last thirty years were a really unprecedented period of transition, and um, um, yeah, it it has shown that unfortunately. Uh, there will be no end of history. Uh, so that might be both positive and negative. Uh, obviously, the liberal or neoliberal end of history uh, did, uh, was not a fulfilled promise, as it was not uh, the Hegelian end of history, uh, where the state will triumph, or the Marxist end of history with a victory of communism. Uh, but that's also not so bad news, because uh, also uh, algorithmic technocracy might not be the end of history as well. right? So um, uh, if there is a kind of permanent logic in these changes, um so um i don't think and i don't think it's only my personal opinion it's more or less commonly shared opinion that the pace of globalization has been kind of uh, uh diminished in the last uh, years especially after the covid and during the covid pandemic but also uh i don't think it's feasible to have a return uh to a state-centered nationalism right so the bridges have already been burned and uh, such return is impossible even for those who want to go there. Uh, so uh, we have to look ahead and what, uh, uh, and, and these are the reasons why, why, why a return is impossible. Uh, some tra more traditional arguments stemming, for example, from the Weltkrisikon uh, Gesellschaft theory of Ulrich Beck, uh, but also uh, from uh, other reasons, uh, some of which is, for example, the impossibility of the nation state to create sufficient ordering matrices for a um, uh, radically globalized world in which we live. Um, and um, yeah, uh, this uh, trend towards uh, uh, new Westphalianism is paralleled also by the rise of technocracy, uh, which of course endangers uh, our democratic societies, but also may, may promote some uh, additional uh, you know, um, channels for democratic inclusion, not to be entirely pessimistic. And uh, that's more or less what I want to share with you. Thank you very much for staying with me. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I, I'm very much uh, available and open for questions.